We're back for another week of defense with D.C. Dan Carroll, USFL defensive coordinator for the Michigan Panthers. Dan, it's great to be back with you again, and it's hard to believe for us that it's week four and a lot of high schools heading into the second half of the season. Yeah, it goes by fast, man. I'm, I've been excited to watch the games and excited to see how, where, where these seasons go through the meat of them here. Definitely. Well, in looking at this time of the year, one of the things you really can start doing is some of the self-scout, some of the game planning, looking at how you're game planning, trying to refine things with where you're at with your current team, uh, how your system has evolved this year. And, and so it's a good time to really take a look at yourself and ensure that everything's rolling in that way as you head into the second half of the season. Yeah, Keith, I think that everybody probably has a, a self-scout strategy and that they scout what they're doing, right? Everybody looks at how many times we've called this pressure or how many times in these situations we've been in this coverage or whatever. And I think that those things are always really good and everybody has their own system for that. But one thing I've kind of discovered over time is I like to self-scout our game planning. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, and and this comes from the idea that I feel like it, it is the job of the coordinator and it's really important to try to be out in front of what's coming next. And, and I'll get into kind of what I mean by that, but I'm, I'm always trying to challenge, like, are we doing the right things? A story that I heard as a younger person that has stuck with me my whole life was that in, in Europe, and I'll try to keep it as brief as I can, that there was like the Black Plague, and it was so ravishing the country and the area that the, the officials there decided that they thought that the dogs and cats had carried it, so they killed all the dogs and cats, like 250,000 dogs and cats, and it turns out that the rats were carrying it. So they had killed all the natural predators of the rats. So the plague actually increased. And so, you know, that's something I've used just in my head for years. Like just make sure we're doing the right things, you know, like make sure we're not killing the cats and dogs, make sure we're we're, we're finding out what the actual issues are and we're doing the right thing. So I've used that to always challenge what we do to make sure that we're doing the right stuff. So, you know, to self scout how we game plan and how, if we're getting to the plays, if we're getting to the things that are actually going to show up in the game. So, you know, one way I do this is that we make a video script. I make a video script for all of our practice periods. So we'll have, let's say, just for instance, we'll use maybe a Tuesday practice on a college schedule is like a 12 play team run play action pass, right? Versus scouts. So I'll pull out the plays that we're going to run for that scout period and they'll be in this in an order that they're going to be on and then I'll put the calls on them right so we have a video script for every practice period and so what we'll do is we'll make a master one for the whole week where we take every play that we repped and we put all the plays every time that we repped it in practice we intercut it right so it'll be the play that we scouted then the next the two or three times we rep the play during the week if it's a big important play we might rep it three times through the whole week and then after the game's over after we play them, I'll go back or me and, you know, the QC or whoever's with me, we'll go back and we'll intercut plays from our game into that master cut. And the point of that is to see how many plays we practiced actually showed up in the game. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So now if they were running counter and we ran, we practiced counter four times, but they ran it twice with jet motion. Like that's not exact. Like that's not, that's not what I'm looking for. So what we'll find is, you know, I used to do this as a, as a GA, just kind of try to give this information to the coaches. We'll find is how many times, how many plays did we rep that showed up in the game and how many times did we rep those plays versus the calls we were in in the game? Okay, so in, in on a USFL schedule, we probably get to rep less plays in just smaller rosters, the whole deal, right, than maybe a college or a high school might. So, you know, if I get to rep maybe 45 or 50 different plays during the week, and some of them, you know, like I said, if it's a really important run, a really important pass play, it might get repped two or three times just with different calls or whatever. But maybe a total different plays, it's 45 or 50 throughout the week. You know, I hope that the goal was to try to get to at least where 70 of those were, were plays from the game. And at least half of those were versus the call that we actually repped it against in practice. So trying to get to those numbers. So when I go back and look at that, if if we're not getting to those numbers, then I got to make some inferences on how we're going to improve that, right? How are we going to make sure we're practicing plays that aren't exactly on the tape? 
right? This, the tape you scout, how are you going to get the practice and the stuff that's not exactly there? So we got to make some inferences and we got to be able to at least walk through some things and talk through some things that could happen. And I know there's, there's two different schools of thoughts. There's, I've worked for both staffs, some staffs that chase any possible play that could ever happen and start filling players' heads with things that <laughs> probably won't ever happen. And then some people that will only rep things that they see on the tape. And, you know, I think both things are, uh, I think those are both extremes. And just like most things in life, the truth is somewhere in the middle. But if you only rep what's on the tape, you're sitting there trying to build a defense and you build adjustments out and you talk about, you know, what's on the tape. We're going to adjust this way, this way, and this way. And it's going to stop all that. And it's almost like you negate the fact that the offense is doing the exact same thing in their staff. Right. And they're making their adjustments. They're talking about what you're doing and how they're going to make their minor adjustments. And then you go in the game and you're like, well, these things are not working exactly right. This is not, not what I thought. And, you know, an example of that for me this year in our second game, we played New Jersey in their first game, they're a straight inside zone team. You could, you know, the back told you everything, the whole deal. Right. So, you know, we try to build some pressures to the back where, where we can chase it down you know, get an edge set away from the back, get, get a chase player to the back, somebody for the quarterback. Felt like we had a good game plan. Felt really good about it. It worked all week in practice. Everybody felt good about it. Okay, so Jersey comes out and starts running those same plays with a bunch set over there, and now we don't even know where to blitz. Well, they'd never showed a bunch in the first game. We didn't know where to blitz. Couldn't get any pressure off that. So this, this little blitz package, this auto blitz package that we built and repped a lot, basically after the first quarter, we couldn't use it. So that was one of those things like, all right, they're not just sitting there letting you do. They're not just going to just keep regurgitating everything on the tape because you're not either, right, as a defensive right. staff. You have your changes and adjustments. So the other thing that over time, and this is kind of looking at these things, just how do the offenses make adjustments? What are the things they do? Because just like all of us, we still have things we believe in, and we're always going to have principles. And what I've found is the biggest adjustments the offenses are going to make are formations and shifts in motions. Right. What that forced me to do over time was teach the game a little differently. Now, I worked for a defense coordinator that I have a lot of respect for, a really, really sharp guy, been a coordinator in a lot of places. And one thing that he say is, is defensive football from an execution standpoint is the first thing is formation recognition. And while I agree with that, the formations are not the first thing I teach because I think the things that tell me about what plays you're going to run are distribution, splits and spacing and so when I say distribution I use these terms and I know everybody's probably heard these terms and they might mean different things to other people and whatnot but this is what they mean to me is flood flow and basic we're talking about offensive distribution every offensive formation fits into one of those three categories and basic is three by two distribution now if you're using the college game you're talking about three receivers to the field two to the boundary and that's counting the back counting fullbacks whatever uh, using a pro game, I just go to strength because, you know, we always did the balls in the middle of the field. So that would be three re three receivers to the passing strength, two receivers away, however that works out. Flow would be four by one. Right? Typically, you know, in the college game, again, to the field, you know, and, and with the pro hashes to the, to the passing strength. And then flood would be three receivers away from passing strength. So think of that like maybe slot formation with the fullback offset to the tight end, and then the back steps up that direction. Or, you know, a lot of times the big formation to get flood out of in the college game is like tight end wings to the boundary with the back offset that way. That's a big pass formation. You get snag seven, you get scissors combination off that, and then you get some version of like spacing where both tight ends run in cuts and the back goes to flat. You, you know, you get like three, three windows right there. So to teach those distributions because what you find is offenses change formations, but they don't change distribution a lot. And you go back to the New Jersey example, all the four by one, four by one in, inside zone, four by one inside zone, four by one inside zone. I got this great plan. Here we go. We're going to blitz, blitz, blitz this way, blitz, blitz this way. Now they make it a bunch formation. Okay. They changed the formation, but they didn't change the distribution. So I think that when you're self-scouting these things about how you game plan, and you're trying to predict what's next, and you're trying to get out in front of, of what an offense is going to do to make sure that, you know, we're repping the plays and we know what's going on. Look at the distribution, right? Do they throw the ball out of basic distribution? That's a, in college football over time, that is a big throw. If you are three by one back week, 
that is typically fast. Okay, now tight end off, you know, sometimes you get some split zone type thing like that. So look at the distributions of the offense, not just the formation. Can they, well, they will keep their distributions the same for the same plays so often, but change the formation. So make sure you're looking at that. How can they stay in this distribution and run this same play, and how can that affect us? That's important when it comes to distribution. And then when you look at shifts in motion, obviously shifts are about being able to get it called out and get realigned to it as fast as you can. All right. When they shift and, you know, I, I saw, you know, BYU was shifting in and out of unbalance. Obviously you can't, Titans can't put their hands down. So that's something you can be alert for, but the shift portion of it, you know, that is just something you got to wrap. You got to see what shifts they have in, but motion. I'm a big fan of early in the week, getting into their motions as early as you can. And whether it's a walkthrough or whether it's practice, I think, or at least in the, in the film room or the meeting room, I think you've got to talk through every run play you expect to see versus every motion. Just because they've only tagged fly motions to inside zones doesn't mean they can't run them with counters, right? So I think that that's going to be that's their next answer is, all right, we're going to add a motion to this, to this run play. We're going to get into a different formation that we've, than we've been in, but still bring the same motion and run the same run play we've been running. So those are things that you really have to look for as you predict kind of where the offense is going to go next and what's going on. And the last thing is the trend. Where is the offense trending? Now, I know you had Jonathan Heimbach on last week, and this is kind of about their Birmingham Stallions, but we played them this past season. The game before, they had just brought in Bo Scarborough. People probably remember him from Alabama, running back, really good player. And they started running this, like, three-back offense um, like T T backfield formation thing. And they ran like four or five times in the game and had some success with it. And it was all in the red zone. So we had planned for it as a red zone, prepped it for red zone, that type of thing. Well, early in the game, we had a little bit of success against them in the past game. And then they went to that up the field and they probably were in that formation 10 or 12 times in the second half. And we didn't have a great plan for that. Right. So, I should have saw that the week before. Like, that's where it was trending. Like, they brought this back in. They got – it. just like this formation popped up. They had some success with it. it. Just did in the red zone last week. But you really should anticipate, all right, it's trending that they might be using this formation more. It might be a bigger part of the game plan this week. So, I think those answers are oftentimes on the tape. You just got to decipher them. Right? You just got to pick through it and really decipher them. I think that you look at formation changes, you look at shift in motion – and you look at, you know, where it's trending. And the other thing, you know, we talk about distribution, splits, and spacing. So distribution we talked about, flood, flow, and basic. Okay, offenses will change formations before they'll change distribution. Okay, then splits. Right? If you're a team that believes in, for example, it's one minor example, but cutting the X receiver split way down to run boot to the field, you're going to do that no matter what the formation is, no matter what the action is. Right? You're not going to leave that guy max split it to run a deep over route that you're going to boot to. So if they're going to cut the X to run that, and there are a lot of times they're going to run it out of a flow distribution and they'll fake the back one back to the boundary and they'll boot out and then the X is on the deep over. Right. So look for splits. What do the splits tell you? And then spacing to me is the adjustment of like two splits. I know this. If any time in college football they cut the X receiver and the number two receiver to the field, wherever the other three eligibles are, you have a chance to get meshed. The other three eligibles could be in any any position you want them to be in. You have a chance to get meshed if they cut the X and they cut number two. I think that those are the things you have to look at from offenses to prepare your players as you go. Like, hey, it might be this formation, it might be that formation, but distribution – splits, and then spacing. Those things tend to stay the same. So that's how I think we're able to build in through our week walkthroughs and our, and our meetings. Like these formations can change. These are the things that are really going to be consistent throughout. So that's kind of how we try to self-scout our game planning and be out in front of the things that are going to you know, come down the road. Yeah, you make some really good points there and some things I want to review and dig back into a little bit. First of all, the use of practice video. Something I didn't do right away. You go back to, I'm thinking my, my first year of college football was 2009, and that's when Huddle came about, right? And I can remember we had just bought a new system. 
we spent a lot of money on the hardware, all those things, and all of a sudden it was it was irrelevant, right? They were bought out by Huddle, and, and now we're using Huddle. So Huddle initially, though, provided a lot of ability to do things quicker. And the first year we didn't get it, but very quickly I saw, like, by the end of the week, if we're tagging our, our practice film, which doesn't take a lot of time, that I can go back through and make cut-ups of what we're doing in practice, a lot like what you talked about there. And I think this is good for offense, defense, special teams, you know, why not bring everything back together and take a look at here's what we did over the course of the week, right? If you're watching practice, most likely, you know, the, the first time you do it, things aren't necessarily tagged. Someone's probably tagging it as you're going through, right? We always have somebody do that. So you're watching sequentially. You're not watching all of, you know, one play or one blitz or whatever it might be. When you start to see those over the the course of the week, you put them together. And for me, this was always like a, a Thursday exercise of taking a look at this and looking back at the week. What do we do? And sometimes it's like, man, you know what? We, we didn't do that very well. So it's the opportunity to fix things up in the, in the last walkthrough or say, you know what? We're going to stay away from this particular call or this particular play. And the other thing we would do is, you know, on the offensive side of the ball, we knew what we're going to do early. We had our openers. So our openers would, would be something we'd always run through on a Friday, you know, our walkthrough on a Friday. Here's, here's the openers. We usually have those on a Thursday too, but really make an emphasis on, okay, this is what we're starting the game with. And the same thing by, you know, after that practice or after the Thursday practice, sometime Friday morning, they're getting a playlist of here's our openers with us doing them in practice, right, against what we expect. So there's a lot that you can do with practice film other than the straight standard, let's watch this sequentially, right? It's it's a little bit of what you're talking about, game planning for yourself, but it's also a review of how good were we really at this over the course of the week. Sometimes you get a feeling, you might get that one play that, man, that looked perfect, and that might bias your memory a little bit of how, how good you are with that right now, and then when you look at it as a whole, it might not look as good or you could see some things to fix up. So I really think the, the use of video like that, you know, you have to plan for it, but I don't think it takes all that much time. And I think it gives you a better look at and a better feel for where your team's at before you head into that game. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of things you do with video you know, and a lot of different people. I've been around a lot of you know great coaches that are extremely organized. So one thing I would say, so w- what I do is, like I said, I build out the practice, the script, the video script of what we're going to do ahead of time. It might be Tuesday morning for a Tuesday afternoon practice, and we'll be in the office, or I'll tell the D-line coach, hey, there's a team run play action pass period up on the, up on the system. It's 12 plays. The calls are in there. The personnels are in there. I want you to card it. And it's the easiest way for me. You know, I've been in the places where, like, okay, what are we going to do? Like, start writing these on the board. You know, I want to get – you know, I want to get, you know, generically blitz left versus uh, inside zone. Who, who's got that one, right? We're right on the board. Right? So what I try to do is, like, make a video of all the plays you want, put the put the calls on them, and then, then from there, divvy out who's got a card what, whether it's, you know, GAs, QCs, or other position coaches, however you do that. But it's just so much more organized than trying to make a list of, you know, get this or get that or whatever. So I try to keep it very organized like that. And then I keep about – five different calls on the overlay so that's like our practice self scout so i can pull that play up and say all right what did we get this play versus okay it's power we've had trouble with power i wanted to get power four times this week versus these four main calls that we're going to be in right or maybe it's three whatever it is right now you know i might be counting walkthroughs in that four or whatever but i can pull that play up and see okay i got a verse over three over four blitz left uh, Mike plug, right? I got to verse those four things. All right. And then that's when the agony comes in for me after the game, when I sit there and I, I make that cut up with the game plays. And, you know, I tell myself, this is me coaching me, right? You spend that whole day USFL and pro schedule. Maybe we play on Sunday. I spend that whole Monday coaching the players on how they messed up. And then I got to go after that and watch the game intercut with what we practice and, and talk to myself about how I messed up, right? Where I was wrong with all those things. So, you know, I think that, just keeping that practice stuff organized and understanding how to be out in front of those things. You know, there's so many things you can do with video. And there's probably a million things I don't know. I'm sure there's somebody out there that could teach me a lot of things about how they're keeping their practice organized and their weeks organized with video. But I think it's so much cleaner to use video than 
a lot of the other ways we do those things. Definitely. And I, I want to get, so I don't forget, I want to get into the forecasting and trends. I have a, a thought on that. But as you were mentioning this, you know, I thought of scripting things and making sure you get the right amount of calls as you script each week. And, you know, thinking back to it for me, that was a very detailed process. And, you know, you'd have a, here's all my calls for the week. Here's what we want to get it against. Here's the tally sheet of how many times we actually got this into the practice script, et cetera. You know, I got tired of doing all that. And I had, I knew quite a bit about how to use Excel. And so I just created a, a template and it, it was, uh, I've shared this on the podcast before, but on the offensive side of the ball, basically it, it, the template was set for every week that we have this many calls for our base runs, this many for our base passes. Thing could fluctuate a, a bit between the two. You know, here's what our third down, red zone, all those things, right? There's certain amount of slots for every single one of those things. And then there were spaces on this sheet as well for what we wanted to see it against. And Putting all those things together, I actually auto-generated my scripts for the week so I didn't have to go through that process of making sure things were done a certain amount of times. And, you you know, I knew based on what cell I put it in because I had just a note there of how many times it would get repped during the week, too. So if I felt something needed a lot more, I'd put that higher on the script. So there's a, a way to automate those. I know I put together uh, some of those for at least a couple defensive coordinators. <laughs> I have to go back and, and find them. But I know when you do things that way, it saves a lot of time because for me, you know, scripting a, a, a practice, just one practice was probably going to be an hour at least, maybe 90 minutes, depending on, you know, I'm going to go back and, and look how many times did I get this right? There's that whole accounting function that you had to to work with. So finding ways to use the technology, you know, the stuff that's out there, I think is uh is is definitely worth looking into and utilizing because it's going to save you a ton of time yeah any way that you can be constantly evaluating yourself and your practices i mean there's so many programs out there that that i've been a part of and something i believe in and we talk to the players and we talk in the program about you know there's nothing more important than how we practice and how we prepare like it's our job to make sure we're preparing the right way and we're not wasting time, we're not wasting reps, and we're making sure we're trying our best to prepare for the things we're going to see. And, and there's a lot of ways you can do it and a lot of technology and different ways to self-scout your own practices. But it, it's a process that you have to come up with for yourself and what's going to work at your place. But it is a process that has to take place if you're trying to you know, get better as the season goes. Definitely. The, the next part was the forecasting and the trends. And you hit it right on the head. First of all, the, the answers are probably there. Uh, they're they're not necessarily screaming to you that hey here's probably where they're going to next, but if you look at you know sit back and just watch not the cut ups but watch the games, and look at where an offensive coordinator progresses from week to week, and you might see that two weeks ago they were using this formation and they were static, and now they're moving into it with a shift or a motion or a shift and motion, and doing the same things again and again like. For me, it's always about making sure that the guys up front have some consistency. And we can move around the backfield and, and you know the guys are going to get the ball. You know, they're, they're able to do a little bit more in, in terms of the adjusting and, and all the things that they're going to do and run their routes you know, from different positions. But those guys up front, you want to keep the consistency. So it, it's exactly what you said. And for me, a lot of times I didn't like to window dress. I like to have specific reasons to either get a matchup or get a certain rotation that we knew we would get with, with a shift or a motion. Those kinds of things provided the advantage. So as you said, they're there for you. You just got to look at what is this guy's pattern? How, how does he progress on this one idea? Uh, for me, I was always sure that if we were able to, you know, those points in the game where you out, you got a little bit of a lead. There was usually a package that I could put in there that maybe I'm not planning for that next game that I wanted to waste your time with, uh, making sure you know that you're going to make sure that you have some answers for it. So I might not even be looking at that one though for a few weeks down the road, but it's my first look at it and I have the opportunity in a game to do it. Right? Sometimes that happens, and sometimes it doesn't. But as you said, the things are there for you to forecast what might be happening 
as far as that offensive coordinator and how he's going to evolve a certain formation or a certain play package, but it's going to be that same play package again. Yeah. I, you know, when you talk about trends and when you talk about seeing where, where the game's going and where things are going, I've been a part of programs and worked for guys who it's, Hey, pull up the 11 personnel first and second down cut up and we're going to watch it. And we're going to watch it a hundred times and we're going to know it by heart, right? We're going to know everything they did in 11 by heart. The problem with that is the game isn't played in a cut up, right? It's played in a, in a live sequential order. And what happens sometimes in cut ups, this is something that, that gets me a little bit and I, I've been a victim of it or I've, of my own mistakes of, of thinking this way sometimes, but a play that shows up four or five times in a cut up, or maybe it's the third or fourth most often run play or, or something like that. You know, 11 personnel, most third, third, most frequent run play. There's also, that's an average. Okay. But there's also, a, a, when you talk about like statistical analysis, a mode and a mode in this case, for, for my purposes is how many different games did the play show up in? So if we got, we're evaluating five games and this play is the second or third most played, but it only showed up in two games we got to figure out why it only showed up in those two games. Even though it's been ran more than the other plays, like sometimes you just get – somebody just gets a, a really good look at counter and they just keep jamming. And it's just what happens. I think watching the cut-ups are important, to, especially early in the week, right? Watch the cut-ups, kind of figure out who they are, what they want to be. The other thing I think nice about watching cut-ups is you can see what defenses they had struggles with. Okay, so you can see, all right, they ran, you know, 21 inside zones – uh, 11 of them they ran versus four down and they were getting them out. You know, seven of them they ran versus a tight front. They struggled. You know, they ran three or four of them versus Bear and they were, you know, they couldn't get anywhere, right? So whatever the case may be, you get a little bit of that understanding too. But once you kind of know who they are, it's game by game, like watching the game and seeing the sequence and seeing where it's going. Like are you saying, where's the offense coordinator going? Like watch game one. Okay, what do they do different in game two? Like what plays now had motions in game two that they didn't have in game one, right? What plays, what formations changed in game two that didn't change you know, in game one? And then, you know, there's some things too when you talk formationally with backfield set. You know, we played two years ago, UMass, we played Florida State. And they're a big counter team and, we had struggled with some gap schemes at times and we had struggled with like um, it's almost like the triple option formation that people get into out of 12 personnel with both tight ends off, but nobody had ever ran counter out of that formation versus us. So they took those two issues that we were having and combined them and they ran probably like 10 or 11 counters out of that formation. But you could see that coming though, because really when they had an off tight end in the back set away from it, they were going to run counter. It didn't matter who was on the other side. It didn't matter if there was an off tight end or he was a slot or it was a nub, whatever. Like that was a counter picture for them. So, you know, I think that there's, there's, there's little things that are in there as you see it trending. And then again, as you watch it game to game to game to game, you can get a feel for where it's going. And then again, you got to be able from distribution, splits and spacing, prepare your players to figure out what's coming next. Definitely. And this, this whole process of that self-scouting your game plan, understanding how much you're calling, when you're calling it, all those things, it allows you to tighten things up as the season goes on, right? And you, when you tighten things up, you make things a little bit simpler for your players. They're going to be able to play faster, which is what we want anyway. We want those guys to go out there and play. We don't want them out there thinking. And I think it was Da Vinci, the, the quote from him, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, right? So, uh, getting things narrowed down to here's what we're really effective at, here's what maximizes our personnel. Those are all things that really come out of this process. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I watched Oregon versus BYU this weekend, and I saw Oregon obviously in the first week versus Georgia, who, you know, Georgia looks like they go into AFC South right now. <laughs> but Oregon, whether – it was just the nature of preparing for BYU or whether they made a conscious effort to do it or, you know, or maybe just as an outsider, I'm not as tuned in as I'd like to be or like to think I am, but they looked simpler on tape. They just looked simpler. They looked playing like they were playing faster. They looked like they had less like sim pressure and pressure package stuff in. They weren't losing the edge like they did against Georgia. Some uh, they were guys were playing well in space. I thought, you know, one thing they were doing is they started to stem the front a little bit, in and out of four down, three down, and stemming late, you know, which is, you know, can be really effective. And, and what happened was they were stopping a run so well, 
on the first drive, they had popped a run or two, but on the second and third and fourth drives, they started stopping the run so well that the ball it became a perimeter game. And BYU was using a lot of perimeter screens, trying to get the ball on the edge. And then, you know, Oregon's DBs, obviously really talented players, uh, were able to get those, you know, force the ball, play with their hands, beat the blocks out there, and, and, you know, make some nice plays on the perimeter. So, you know, I just think whether they tried to do it or it was just the nature of this game plan, it just looked tight. It looked clean. It looked simple. And it looked like their guys just – they let them guys play, and they played a lot faster than they did against Georgia. So, uh, you know, kudos to those guys. I think that that's a – it's important to be able to take a step back and say, all right, what are we doing well? What aren't we doing, you know, well enough? And, you know, and I'm not going to say this necessarily happened either, but it does remind me of just when you've had success like Dan Lanning did at Georgia and you've been somewhere for so long and, and you, your package, your defensive package evolves over time, you got to be cautious when you go to the next place. Like you didn't start the Georgia defense at the same place where you finished it. Like you can't necessarily go to the next place and expect, you know, for you it's picking up where you left off. For the players it's not. And I'm not saying that necessarily happened there at all. I have no idea what's happening there. But it, it does remind me of those situations that happen sometimes. Like you go and now you have this defense that you've built for three and four years and you start at that point, day one with your new team. Well, you know, those guys at Georgia have been in the thing three, four years. And, you know, they had built up some acumen to the defense and, and, and the language and how you coach and those things. So I just would caution anybody that – you know, had success as a coordinator at one place and you build through that thing three, four years, and then you go to a new spot and you need to pull out your notes from year one at the previous place and, and start there, you know, closer to that spot because it, it is, uh, you know, it is a linear process and learning this stuff for a lot of these players. Dan, that's an excellent point and something I experienced as well. I know for me, changing jobs, you think, I'm going to go for the one. And, and you do forget sometimes that we did not start here with this. You have all these great ideas, but there's been an evolution with your players and how that works. So that that's a great point. Definitely something to remember for anybody out there as, as you get into that new situation, right? End of the season is going to come up. A lot of people change jobs. That's definitely something to bring along and put in your notes right now. And remember before you get out there with that new team. So, Dan, that takes us into our option tips this week. Defending the option, and this week we're going to look at defending it from a four-down structure. What do you have for us? Yeah, so, again, got to watch Air Force again this week with uh, against Wyoming. thought Wyoming did an unbelievable job, especially up front. D-line was really good. Uh, a friend of mine, the guy I worked with two years in Houston, is a D-line coach for Oscar Giles. I thought they did a great job. But from a 4-3 spacing perspective, we're – you know, which against traditional option formations, you basically look like old school 4-3 hip like you would, you know, for 21 personnel, uh, you know, like 1994 football. So the, a couple of things with that, you know, a lot of times you're asking, especially when you stay too high, right? you're a 4-3 and you're a too high structure. Uh, you're asking that front side, outside linebacker to be your alley player, right? We know that versus typical option plays you're going to get arcs first too high, meaning the slot's going to widen. He's going to, you know, outside release wide, and he's going to go arc for support is what they would tell him, right? And the support and too high is going to be that front side. He's typically what they're thinking, right? So he's going to arc for support so that that front side safety is going to be the force on the pitch. And then the, the onside linebacker, the outside backer, who, you know, you might have him in a, in a 90 or so, he's going to be the alley player. You know, he comes straight downhill and then he, you know, feathers out to the pitch. One thing that can happen with those guys, if you're playing this structure, more so than a lot of other structures for your alley player, is because they're a little closer to the ball than your alley player normally is. Normally, he's a he's a high safety or he's the you know he's the he's a, a thirty backer or whatever, like he's tucked in there, whatever it is. This is the widest alley player you typically have in these structures. So, what happens is sometimes he gets out in front of the pitch. So when you're coaching those guys, and, and here's where I'll also say I'm going to contradict myself in practice. I always let those guys get out in front of the pitch because I felt like the scout team was going to not play as fast. So I want the players, to, the defensive players to play fast and the scout team is not going to be as fast as Air Force's team. So if they're out in front of the pitch in practice, they'll probably be right on time in the game. But they have to know, hey, this is fine in practice because they're slower, but this cannot happen in the game, right? And that ha actually happened to Wyoming. Now their pursuit and their effort was relentless, so it didn't even hurt them. But I saw it show up a few times and I had the same issues coaching in the four down system like you can get those guys out in front of the pitch really easily just because they're so close to it you know and that's not something you usually worry about 
when you're playing like a three down structure or two high structure or um, a three down structure counting the front side backer in the alley or the backside safety in the alley because those guys have such a long way to go. You're worried about them getting there. Whereas in a four three spacing, sometimes you know, you're not worried about them getting there as much. There's nobody going to block them. They're going to be right to the alley. So I think that's something just to keep in mind when you coach 4-3 and you coach the outside backers is that there's a tendency for you guys to outrun the pitch. And uh, I would try to keep them at the line a little bit longer and shuffle down and then burst through the alley before they get there. So that's one thing. You know, the other thing, you know, the five techniques that you get playing four down are, are really good to help the backers in, in this instance. And, and, you know, where this thing's evolved in stopping the option is – you talk to a lot of guys that coach defense at the academies. And I've, I've listened to probably all of them speak, and I've worked with guys that have worked with them in, in these things. And there's a lot of guys, and I don't start rip rattling off names because I don't want to forget anybody, but there's two or three guys that have a lot of option experience just coaching defense at the academies, and they move on to coach it, you know, at other places. But the three, four, too high, like the tight four structure is what a lot of those guys believe in. You know, and, and it gives you the ability to blitz a little bit. It gives you edges for different things. And I think those are great. I think that I think that structure is great. I've played the played the option in that structure before. The the problem I have with it is there's a couple of things that are really affecting your ability to play that now. And one of them is just a straight like fullback mid zone. Air Force runs a lot of it. Army runs a lot of it. And it's this like uh, just fullback almost like at the outside leg of the guard mid zone type play. And I say it makes it hard to run the three, four, because without that, because anytime the slot blocks the outside linebacker, it's not an option play anymore. So if the slot is blocked, you're in three, four structure and the slot blocks your outside backer. That is not option anymore. And right? they don't run, they don't not, no option play. I've seen in 10 years of playing these guys does the slot block the outside backer. So once he does that, you're going to get some type of dive, but it puts that outside backer in conflict between being able to get hands on that tackle and play in the slot who might crash down on his ribs, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, before they were running that play a lot, that the slot was never messing with that guy. He could always jam the tackle, jam the tackle. Now if he steps down to jam the tackle and the slot puts his inside shoulder through that guy's ribs, the fullback is going to fall off the tape. It's going to be six yards before we can get anybody there. So you, you've had to adjust kind of how you play those outside backers, and it's kind of, in my opinion, made the three, four structure a little harder. If somebody's really effective running that play, like I said, you know, Delaware saw that play and they were able to play the nose front side and get a cut off before it got out there. So that was really good by them, but it's just that there's some evolutions as the offense has evolved and the defense has evolved where things get harder. So you, you don't see the backers, you see it a little bit harder for the backers to get to the alley in the three, four structure with this because the tackles are always free releasing up, free releasing up and getting width. And they, you know, they got a lot of things they can do. Now, watching Wyoming in a four-down spacing, their five techniques jamming those tackles and the backers were rolling, right? They were not having the same issue. So I do think, you know, the, the four-down spacing to, to get the, keep the backers active and keep the tackles from free releasing up. I mean, when those tackles can, what I call horn, they can release with width and vertical and, and block safeties and sit there and wait for the, the, okay, okay, linebacker, come on, you're late to the alley. I'm sitting here waiting on you. And when they can do that, it gets really hard and you got to start coaching the backers different. All right. If he's this wide, you, you know, you can take the inside lane. We're trying to beat him over top, but then you can take the inside now. It just gets, it gets hairy sometimes, but in the four down, you know, it has its problems too. They all do. And they're going to attack where they attack, but it is interesting just watching Wyoming, just how little that the guys were able to get up to the linebackers, how active the backers could be in the game. So I thought that was really good. I thought that was a good, just reminded me a little bit of, of what the four down structure can be because the last few times I've played, these guys have been in different structures. So just reminded me a little bit like, yeah, four down structure still has a lot of merit in, in a lot of ways. Well, Dan's been another great week of talking ball here and focusing on the defense. And as we head into the second half of the season for the high school level and uh, getting into maybe the second third of the season here for colleges, definitely look forward to more of these conversations and tips for defenses to use during the season. Thank you. Thanks for having me on.